Well, good morning. This is Debbie Playtech, and I'm the Assistant Director of Education and Accreditation at the Illinois State Medical Society. Welcome to a PARS training for accredited providers. I know some of you on the call are brand new to PARS, and this is the first year you'll have to enter data and do the attestation, and others of you are just uh, listening in to refresh yourself. So we're really glad that you're here today. Um, with me today is Evelyn Calhoun. Evelyn is the Accreditation um, and Education Coordinator for ISMS, and she is your main contact person for PARS. And so if you have any questions following the webinar, please feel free to contact Evelyn or me, and we would be happy to assist you. Just a couple of So the today in our agenda, you'll see, you're going to learn how to log into PARS. Now, PARS is the Program and Activity Reporting System. It's um, based on the ACCME's website. It's not based on the ISMS website. And so you will have to have a unique login to use it and we'll cover that today. Once you're inside the PARS system, we'll teach you how to navigate within it, get help, how you can uh, review your organization's data to make sure it's complete. We will cover that. You're going to enter data about the CME activities you've held throughout the year. In this case, you'll be entering 2014 information. And so we're gonna teach you how to add, delete, and update that information. Once it's all correctly entered, you have to close your activity. So we'll teach you that today. And at the end of every year, um, and it becomes available in January the following year, there's an attestation page. And we will cover what that is and how you go ahead and complete that. And then before we finish today, we're going to give you your next step. So you make sure you're on track to be able to enter your information into PARS. Okay, Evelyn and I are sharing the controls today. And we're going to take you directly to the PARS um, screen so that you can see how to actually go about entering in. So, Evelyn, if you want to take over. Good morning, everyone. Um, the website for the ACCME is www.accme.org, and Debbie has put us to the place um, on the ACCME's website that um, brings you right to what is a login. So I'm going to go ahead and log in so that we can show you what you would have to enter, how easy it is, and then go further from there. While everyone's entering that in, we would just want to let you know at the end of the call, if you haven't been provided yet with this login information, that will be sent to you. So this is typically, um, for all of our accredited providers, we have given the ACCME the most updated information for you as the accredited provider. Should you have any changes or staffing, contact, email, because we know that does happen. We just ask that you contact WRI so that we can update the information, not only in PARS, but we have other areas here at ISMS that we need updated. So if you have any of those changes or if you get into the system when you do get your login information, if you see something that is incorrect, please contact me and I'll make sure that we get that updated. One of the things about the PARS system is if you see right here in red, it says, please don't, do not use the back or forward buttons on your browser when navigating in PARS. If you use your back button, it will literally log you out of the system and you'll have to log back in. There's other mechanisms that when you're in PARS that you can utilize that will not log you out of the system and, we'll, and I'll show you that as we go through things. Okay, if you see the little question marks, here on the um, PAR system, those are kind of like your help functions. A lot of times when you click on them, it'll, it'll pop stuff up. I'm going to actually click on this one. All right, let's do this one. If you click on the little question marks, it literally takes you to the ACCME's website and it tells you how you can update the organization type, which 
would be something that I would have to do, but at least if you hit one of the little question marks anywhere in the PAR system, it will take you to ACCME's website and give you the information you need, or as Debbie's already stated, you can always contact her or I and we'd be happy to help. And then just so you see, to close out of this screen and to go back to where you were working from, you would just go to the top and close out and you should be back at the PAR screen that you started at. Again, if you hit this back button back here, it would have literally logged me out of the system and we would have had to re-log in. The other function that is up here, um, when you get a password from the ACCME, it's a lot of numbers and it's a lot of letters and it's kind of confusing but you have the option to go up to here under where it will say logged in as you. It'll say change your password and you can make it something that you will remember much easier. So you have that as an option. And I know we sent you out links to the introductory videos. If you haven't watched those, once you get into PARS itself, you can click to the videos from this link so you wouldn't have to have a separate browser window open. So again, like if you're working in PARS and you need a little help, just know that it's right there on this home screen and at any time you can go to those. Okay. You have a bunch of the tabs up here on the PARS system. This is just the home page, so when you log in with your information, you're going to see pretty much the same kind of information that's here. If you click on the My Organization tab, it it will have whatever accreditation information your your organization currently has would also be listed. We're using a test user that we've developed, so there is nothing in that information. You will not be able to change that information. That is information that ISMS gives to the ACCME. Just to make a note to you, too, anyone who's listed in this contact line down here at the bottom, they have full access to PARS. Generally speaking, most organizations only have one individual that actually enters the data. There's no partial access, as there is sometimes with databases. So if your CEO <laughs> wants to change data, he or she could, uh, I would doubt they do. But um, once the information is in here, they have full access to everything in PARS. So it's important to make sure that the people who are going to be using it understand how to use it and how they can affect the data. Okay, some of the other tabs. We have three other tabs up here. This one is, is the Activities tab, which I'm going to click on. And this is actually where you will go in to the PARS system and enter your activity data. And we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. I want to kind of highlight the other tabs that are sitting here. Um, this is our program summary tab. As Debbie mentioned, in January um, we will get um, what will be called the attestation page, which is not listed here, but that will be attached to this section of it. Um, and we will go back to this uh, again in a little bit as well. Um, the user management, you do have the the capabilities to update and delete users. Again, we've just asked that you not do that, that you contact me so that I make sure that all of our um, our information for all of our necessities is, is accomplished. So we're going to start here with the entering activity data. And this is the heart, the guts of PARS. And this is where you will spend most of your time. We've preloaded a couple of activities, and Evelyn's going to take over at this point to show you how to enter the data for activities that happen throughout the year. Because most of you are new at um, your positions, um, entering data into the PAR system, I'm going to take you step by step, and we're going to go in and we're going to add an activity and show you that it really is quite easy. So if you click Add an Activity, it's going to ask you what year, which it should be automatically, and in this instance it is, 2014, because that's the year we're wanting to enter, and you just hit Continue. Sorry, the system's being a little slow. Again, here's a, here's a little question mark that if you're not sure what activity type and you have questions on it, 
You can click on that and it will take you to the ACCME's page that describes all those activity types. But if you hit the little um, arrow there, it lists all of the possible activity types. Most of the activities that you will be entering for most of our providers are courses or regularly scheduled series. Those are the two that we're going to talk about today. If you have any other types of the activities and you have any questions, just feel free to call Debbie and I when I, you get ready to enter those activities, and we'd be more than happy to talk you through those. One thing to point out is uh, your course is your basic live activities. If you were having an Internet course uh, that was live, and that would be um, something that you weren't going to record it and offer it later as an enduring material, you would choose Internet Live Course. That's kind of like a standalone activity. If you go back and take that recording and turn it into another activity, at that point it's a new activity and you would select Internet Activity Enduring Material. If you were going to offer that, let's say, through your hospital intranet or on a DVD or in, in any other method. So just to differentiate, when you do it the first time live and that's how you get credit, that would be the Internet Live course. But for our purposes, we're going to enter in information for straight courses, live events. Okay, so we've got our course. It's a lecture. So we're going to click Lecture. We're going to give it an, the activity title, which is, um, we'll just do CHF. Sorry. We'll just call it CHF 101. All right. Um, as you can see, provider activity ID is optional. So if you see that in, whenever you're entering into PARS, it is not required that you enter those fields. You can, but you're not required to. The ones that um, are required, you'll see a little asterisk next to those. And if you forget to enter a field, we'll go through that in just a few minutes. So you can see all Evelyn's adding in is the type, the title, the location, and this is a course, so she's going to enter in the activity date. And then the next section um, is called providership, and that would be if it's uh, directly provided by your organization or if you're doing this in a joint provider relationship. If you do a joint provider, you would go ahead and enter the name here. Again, it's optional, but it's not a bad idea. It will help you and us track the information. The next field is the hours of instruction. And that's, that's literally, you know, as it is, like how long was it happening for, two hours. It might be different than the following field, which is the AMA PRA Category 1 credits. But in most cases, for courses or a live course, you're going to find those numbers are the same. We encourage providers to enter both hours of instruction and AMA PRA Category 1 credits. This is the ACCME system, so they're not necessarily tracking the credits, but we think it keeps providers on track to know how many credits they gave out. The next, the next part down here, because you can see description of content, that's optional. Again, if you want to put that information in there, feel free to put that information, but it's not required. However, this is required. If you were, your activity was designed to change competence, you have to check the yes or the no. You also have to check whether the changes in competence were evaluated, yes or no. And we're going to just tell it yes for competence, and we're going to tell it no for performance and patient outcomes. The next field down here is, um, again, this is an optional field that if you want to put in the competencies, you can. If you click on the uh, little box here, it does give you, oops, I'm sorry. It does give you those competencies and you can check them. Again, that is optional. The number of uh, physicians who completed the activity, 
since I put the date of November 30th and today is the 4th of November, we wouldn't necessarily have all that information. So you could, at this point, leave it. Um, since we're just doing a test right now, I can put in, you know, we had 30 physicians and we had 12 non-physicians attend the activity. Uh, commercial support received is not optional. You have to tell it yes or no. For this one, we're going to tell it yes because we just kind of want to touch base on that. Um, number of commercial supporters, we're just going to say we had one. We're going to put we had $1,000 in there um, and that it was for facilities and space. So, Evelyn sent two things. She's indicated the amount of money, which was $1,000, and she's also indicated that they also um, gave us some in-kind support. So, in-kind support is when a commercial supporter says, uh, you can borrow this equipment for the day, or you can use the uh, facilities at such and so location. Um, occasionally you see this with surgical uh, training, uh, perhaps where there's equipment that's specific or you're located off-site. And in such case, you would check the boxes. If it's only money that you've received through a letter of agreement, um, then you only have to put in the dollar amount. You do not have to check those boxes. The other, the other box that you have here is that if you receive any advertising and exhibit income, you need to make sure that you put that information in at the activity level. So whatever activity that you receive your commercial support from needs to be with your activity that you enter uh, along with the advertising and exhibit income. If that was received for a specific activity, when you enter that data, you need to make sure that you put it in down here below. And I, because this is going to confuse you because it's marked optional, we recommend you put it in here. It'll associate the money you get with the activity you got it for. And by putting it here, it will show up automatically in your year-end report. Um, and you'll only just be checking for accuracy at that point. It'll be much simpler for you. Later on, you'll know which activities were commercially supported. Like in a year or two, when you've kind of forgotten the details, you can actually go back and print a report and say, oh, well, this CHF was commercially supported and there was advertising income. Um, so that's why we recommend putting it in at this level. The other thing is some of you know what the FDA's Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy Education is about. Right now there is one uh, REMS activity, and that's on um, long-acting and extended-release opioids. If for whatever reason you are doing that activity within 2014, you can go ahead and respond to these questions here. Um, if if you aren't doing one, it automatically populates with this not a REMS activity, so you don't have to do anything at this point. But if you did have a REMS activity, you can see the only one you're offered is this extended release. But in our case, we don't have a REMS activity, so we don't have to do anything at this point. So before we go on, we're, I'm just going to scroll up the page and just let you look for a second again, just a quick review. The activity type is there. The subcategory was lecture. Here's the title, the location. Let's say you have the same course, and you're going to offer it. Some of you are in a consortium, so you have like three or four locations. So let's say our CHF 101 was going to be offered at multiple sites um, on multiple days. Each of those would be considered an individual um, course in and of itself because the day would change, the location would change. If you did it twice at two locations in one day, again, you have two locations, so you would enter that as two separate courses. So right now we only have it showing up as CHF 101 being offered in Chicago, but if we offered it in Evanston, we would start another um, activity course sheet for that Evanston course. And again, if that confuses you and you get to that point, please just give Evelyn a call and she'll walk you through it to make sure, you know, that you have everything that you need. 
So once you've entered this information in, you'll get to the bottom. And here's where you get to make some choices. You can quit without saving the data, like, uh-oh, we're not going to do that after all. That probably won't happen too often. You can save and quit completely the application, or you can save and add another activity. And if you don't do anything, I mean, if, you know, if you just closed out of the screen, nothing would be saved. But um, for our purposes, we're going to save and we're going to go to add another activity. And you'll get this confirmation. The new activity was added, and then you click continue, which is obvious. Now, what you're going to notice in 2015, after January, you're going to have to make sure that you're selecting 2014. So right now we're in November of 2014, and so that's all that's showing up. But if I haven't entered any of my data and it's January 15th, it'll default to 2015. So please double check that you do the drop-down menu and select 2014 so that you can enter and complete the data for this year. Evelyn's going now to regularly scheduled series because they're handled slightly different than the course. She's entering in the title name, the location, that's pretty typical. And then we're just going to pick uh, direct providership. You can tab through these. You can bring your cursor over to it. Now, here's where it gets a little different with the hours of instruction. So what happens with the regularly scheduled series is you enter it one time. You can pick the activity date. Some people pick the beginning of the year and their activity date may be January. Others pick the end of the year date. For, for this purpose, I just picked the end of the year. What a lot of people do is for each of the breast cancer conferences that hand, is handled monthly, it's for one hour every Wednesday morning. and the hours of instruction for that would be one. However, the amount of AMA credits that is totaled, oh, I'm sorry, my apologies, I have it reversed. My apologies. So let's say your um, breast cancer conference meets once a month. And so in 2014, it's going to meet 12 times. The total hours of instruction, how often did it meet, you know, total hours of instruction would be the 12. And this is where the AMA section comes in handy. However, it met 12 times for one credit apiece. And that's what we have. So just to clarify, for regularly scheduled series, you're going to put a summary of basically how many times did it meet or how many hours of instruction over the course of the entire year. We'll come back to that at the end in case you're confused. And we're, you know, sorry for the confusion. But again, you enter in the total number of hours of instruction for the entire year for every RSS. And that's why we say pick whatever date makes sense to you. Uh, to us, using the end of the year makes sense, then you know you've captured everything. Again, it's the same thing. There's this optional content box, which you don't have to complete. Um, we've checked that it's to change competence and performance. And um, in this case, where the change is evaluated, Evelyn has no check for those. So, um, you know, she might want to change that up because you should be evaluating your activities. If you had the um, competencies, uh, you know, on your planning form and you want to also put it here, feel free to pick whichever ones you use. Institute of Medicine, some of you use. You could check that. But, again, this is an optional field. Um, the participation numbers. Now, how do you do this part? So now here we are at the end of the year. We've met 12 times. Each time there were 10 doctors present. So if you do the math, that's 12 times 10. So we had a total number of 120 physicians. Each time we met, we had one non-physician. So it's 1 times 12, and that's your number. So. Some people have a separate database where they're tracking um, statistics on attendance. You can transfer over that information at the end of the year. Others like to keep a running tally. It's whatever practice works for you. All you need to do is make sure that at the end of the year, you've included all the attendees who 
actually were there over the course of the meetings of the RSS itself. In this case, we met 12 times, and there were 10 doctors at each, and that's how we got our 120. So we didn't have any commercial support for this activity. We didn't have any advertising and income, any of that information. So we're going to save, and we're going to add another activity. Again, it gives you confirmation. You just hit continue. It brings you back to the reporting year, and you just hit continue again. And it brings you back to the spot where that you can start your next activity. If you're going to do an enduring material, if you're one of the providers that has that information, you would just come down here and click enduring material, fill in the information that is needed. The one thing that we do want to um, stress about enduring materials are that because usually your enduring materials are approved for three years, you want to put the year that you first started it. So for for, for this case, let's uh, just call it and put the date of. We're going to put today's date because we decided we're going to record this webinar, so we're going to make it an enduring material. So while Evelyn's entering the date, again, you can see this, this screen is the same. It's, you know, you're just entering in the, the details of your enduring material. But now, whereas an RSS, you did a cumulative in an enduring material, if it was only accredited for um, one AMA PRA category credit or, you know, hours of instruction was one, that's all you enter here. You enter the one and then you put the one for the um, AMA. You check the boxes for confidence, performance, patient outcomes. Uh, it's optional for the uh, competencies. And now what you're going to enter is the number of physician attendees, the number of physicians who actually took that course in the current year. So we're in 2014, and 10 doctors actually took the course, and there were no non-physicians. When we go to 2014, and we'll show you how to copy this information onto it, when we go to 2015, you're going to enter data just for 2015. This is a three-year course, however, you're going to enter it on a year-by-year -year basis. Evelyn has um, saved that, quit and saved, and now you can see that this is kind of a summary page of, of the different activities. You see the different open tabs, open activities, closed activities. We'll go to the open activities first. So if you're in the Open Activities tab, and we have this regularly scheduled series that we entered, there's a couple things you can do here. You can view it, you can update it, or as Debbie just mentioned about the um, enduring material, and I'll do this when I click down below in just a moment, um, you can actually copy that. So for things that you repeat on a yearly basis, this is a really nice feature because you don't have to do all the entry data for those activities. You can literally just hit this copy button and change, maybe it's the date, maybe it's the function, maybe in the number of participants, that the place, that, that kind of thing. The reason this is open and we're going to hit update is because something in the required fields on the PAR system so you can see here it says this activity is open. Underlying fields are required to close the activity. Please complete all underlying fields at your earliest convenience. So in order to close out the PAR system at the end of the year, which that will be like by February, um, all the fields that are required by the PAR system have to be entered. So since I didn't put the number of physicians who completed the activity, that is why this activity is still called open. Once I enter that information, and we're going to just say 25 physicians completed that activity, we're going to again scroll down to the bottom, and we're going to save and quit so that we make sure that that activity is taken care of. It says it was updated, so you just hit continue. 
And now when you click on the Open Activities tab, the only thing that is still left open is that enduring material that, we, that we've already discussed and just entered. And if you're wondering where that activity we just closed went to, it's located under the regularly scheduled series under the Closed Activities tab. See it right there, Breast Cancer Conference. So that's what happens. At the end of the year, all of your open activities should end up in the closed tab when you have, um, you know, sorted them all out, made sure that everything was correctly entered, um, it filled in all those spots that came back red, then everything will flip over to that closed activity tab. I'm just going to show everyone real quick. If you hit the copy function for this enduring material, it's going to say, okay, what year would you like to do to copy this to? And so because it's a three-year approval, I could copy that into 2015, which I'm not going to do at this point. Well, yes, I'm going to do that because I want you to see that. I won't be able to do for 2016 because obviously that's not uh, an option at the moment. But So as you can see, it's copied all the basic information, and I can put twenty fifteen's that in information. It still shows that it was directly provided. It still has the hours of credit. It still has the design to change components. We were evaluating it. We weren't doing the other stuff. And so at the end of 2015, I can just scroll down here and put in the number of participants and the number of non-participants. There was no commercial support and save and quit for 2015. So the only thing you really have to do when you're copying an activity is change the date. If there's a location, depending on the type of activity that you're copying, the number of physicians and, and non-physicians that you're entering. So this will be useful if you have a course that you offer in multiple locations or on multiple days. You can use the copy function and just enter the new date and the new number of attendees, participants. So we'll continue and show you. Um, Evelyn's going to close out the enduring material here. So you go to update. You get the screen. It tells you somewhere the underlying fields need to be completed. And the fields are always in red. Okay, now this is interesting. In actuality, this is an example of when you would quit without saving, and here's why. We were, here's what will happen in January. We just sort of looked at it and said, oh, there's something open, and, and didn't really pay attention to what reporting year it's open for. But it hasn't really happened yet. We just copied this activity, this enduring material, we copied it into 2015. So do you see, this is why you need to be paying attention to this down arrow. We want to go back and see what's left open in 2014. We can't close the 2015 activity. It hasn't even happened. So now I, I select 2014, and you'll see there's that same enduring material, but now I'm going to be in the correct 2014, and now we're going to update it by opening it, finding out what was missing. We're looking for the red. Oh, I didn't answer the question. Did we get commercial support? No. Is there anything else? No. At this point, we save and quit. You get the confirmation. You continue. And now you'll see that in the Open Activities tab area, it says no open activities found. So now let's scroll forward. It's January 1. You've entered data for all of your courses. You know, maybe you did that uh, the end of the year, or maybe you're going to do it the first week of January. All of your courses should show up now under the Closed Activities tab, which all of ours do. Here they all are. If you look at this and you say, oh, my gosh, I put Breast Cancer Conference in twice, or, oh, we never did that activity, that ABC activity, this is where you can go to that button that says Select for Deletion. And then you click it. And then you go back up to the tab, and it says,
delete selected activities, and you get this one more time to say yes or no, and then it's gone. You see, it's gone. So there are, are just different ways that you can manipulate your information um, so that you make sure it's accurate. What we're going to ask you to do is to enter your data, check for accuracy, and then eventually in 2015, early in the year, you'll attest that everything you're looking at is correct, that you put all the information in and that, you know, you've corrected any misinformation that you had. All right, now let's move to the Program Summary tab. So we're getting late into 2014, and this is going to be pertinent um, next uh, in 2015. Um, ISMS requires that you enter all your data into PARS, you attest that it's correct, by the middle of February. You'll get a reminder about that. Uh, so you can see just by looking at this sheet that the different bits of information we entered in, the commercial support is there, that $1,000. We got some advertising income for one of our activities. It's there already entered because we did it at the activity level. If there was some other chunk of money you got, for instance, from advertising, uh, you could enter it here. Like, let's say we, we got a grant, um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't even from, uh, maybe it was for our foundation, for instance. Whatever. We can still enter a little more money here at this point. And then other sources of income. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you can see that if you entered any income sources, that first line says income received from other sources, aggregated from information you provided about your individual activities. But most of you may not, may not know that information throughout the year. Uh, most of you operate on like a hospital or an organizational budget. At some point at the end of the year, you're going to need to find out, you know, where does the money come from and how much is it? Maybe you're going to have to talk to a manager ahead of time. Some of you may already have access to this information. It varies from organization to organization. But in order to save this, in order to attest to its accuracy, you're going to have to put in a number there under income received from other sources. This could be salaries, this could be overhead expenses, this could be transfers from your internal foundation. Um, it's really, it's whatever sources of income that are not commercial sources of income. So when you know that number, you'll enter it there. Evelyn has put in $25,000. And then you're going to also have to come up with an aggregate total of, again, how much are your program expenses. This could include salaries, um, maybe it's rental of equipment, maybe it's the um, catering that you offer. And we would expect that these two numbers are very similar. If you said that it was a 255,000, you know, or that's 2 million, whatever, if you had a huge number there, we would know that there would be some error because you said you only got $25,000 in expenses. So we would expect that these numbers are the same or very near the same because most people don't operate at a loss. Um, but, you know, you'll have to work within your organization, and please feel free to call us if you have questions um, about getting that information, and we'll be happy to help you um, direct you to the right person within your company or organization. So when you're done with entering the commercial support by single activities, um, your advertising and expenses, um, and your income and your expenses, like Debbie just mentioned. You would just hit program summary after you reviewed all your data and you've entered your, your information. Okay, we're going to just let you look at this page just for a minute while we switch back over to our slides. So we've talked about logging in. We've uh, shown you a little bit about how to navigate within PARS. We talked about how you can get help by going to those question functions. There's a page where you can review your organization's data, and if you see that um, some of it's incorrect, you can contact us and we'll help you to correct that. You can add, delete, and update activities into PARS. 
Now you've um, been shown how to close an activity. And we've talked a little bit about the year-end attestation page. This is a summary of that program summary we just showed you. However, there's no data entered in this one. But again, this page at the end of the year will eventually show at the bottom, I attest to the accuracy of this data. That does not show up until 2015, calendar year 2015. So I think if you look like January 1st or 2nd, it appears automatically. Right now, all you will see is the save program summary and um, this little area here, that's all you can see right now. But eventually, there'll be a second red button and it'll say, I attest. What we do, once you've attested, we get an email that says, um, you know, Paul Dean at election attested to his data. We review it. We contact you if we feel that there's something that seems a little off. Um, the ACCME eventually contacts us if we have data that to them seems a little out of the ordinary. So we try to do all that on our own so that we never, you know, get the ACCME's call that says, hey, there's something up here. But just so you know, that's what's um, going to appear. That second button will appear. All right, let's talk about your next steps. If you've never um, received an email from the ISMS with your organization ID number and your login instructions, by tomorrow, and it'll probably be by the end of the day, uh, you'll receive an email from Evelyn. And it's going to give you your organization ID and your login instructions. If you've been using the login information from someone who was previously in your position or at your organization, uh, we want you to stop doing that and we want you to have your own ID and login instructions. So you'll be getting that by tomorrow morning. Uh, by November 18th, so that's just a couple of weeks, we want those of you who are new to at least complete the PARS login process. Even if you don't have time to enter data, we want to make sure that you can actually log into PARS. And remember, you're going to go to PARS, you're going to have the information we give you, and then you're going to have to retain that password that gets sent back to you. Once you get that, you'll log in, make sure it works, and if you need any assistance, if something's not working, please contact Evelyn. Occasionally, we found providers will have an issue, and it'll be with their um, IS or their IT department. It won't be with PARS, and it won't be with ISMS. It'll be something at your organization. So we've learned to recognize those situations. So if you're having trouble at all, please call Evelyn, and she will walk you through the process and or contact whoever might need to be contacted for help. Then we're saying in about a month, by December 8th, we really do want you to make sure you've gone into PARS, used that login process, uh, process, and entered some data for your activities. And we'd like you to enter data for each type of activity, just so that you are sure you know. Because once 2015 comes, it gets a little crazier. <laughs> and, um, you know, we want you to start that process. We really encourage providers to enter activity data throughout the whole year. It just is very helpful to not have to face that task. But again, by December 8th, log into PARS and um, enter some data. And we will be checking, um, not in any punitive way, but just checking to make sure and giving you a nudge um, that if you haven't entered data by December 8th, we'll probably contact you and, and ask you to please do that. Again, early in January, um, you will go back into the PAR system, finish entering your data, and then whenever you finish that, you will complete that attestation page. Um, there will be a special button on the program summary page that will allow you to attest that your data is complete. Um, if for whatever reason you've attested that it's complete and you find out you've completely missed something or put something in an error, all you need to do is contact Evelyn and we can unlock your attestation page. You can make the corrections that you need, reattest, and then, you know, it'll be all set. But I, I can't emphasize enough that if you have questions at any point in time, please call Evelyn. I'm happy to help as well, but she is the primary contact. Um, we haven't really received any questions. We did have one question. Okay. Um, it was under participation 
Would other learners be residents, RNs, and other allied professionals? What about medical staff that are not practicing medicine but are in an administrative role? So, again, um, CME Category 1, as we all know, the AMA says it's for physicians. So that first number that you enter is for physician participants. The second number that you enter is anybody else. Um, so if your CEO is there and if there are nurses present, they fall into the secondary category of anyone else. We're primarily tracking the physician participants, and that's MDs and um, DOs, and um, everyone else falls into that second category. So that's All right, well, if you have additional questions, you know how to contact us, please do. Um, we just really appreciate your participation today, and we are always happy to answer any questions that you might have.